The Old Testament reading for the Sunday of the Transfiguration is found in the second chapter of 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elijah replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left. The two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, Suddenly, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. This is the word of our God. Our epistle lesson is found in the third chapter of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. If, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory, displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of God. Please stand for the reading. <laughs> After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, 
one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, there on the Mount of Transfiguration, you showed the glory of the world to come. But it wasn't for the world to come. It was for us here and now to be your followers, strengthened knowing that far, far better places wait for us. So enable us, Lord, to keep the faith and follow you and do the work that you have planned for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind. Yes, a whirlwind. That was the best flying technology they had in the ancient world. Today we have a brand new plane that can launch rockets and satellites into space. This plane is bigger, has a wingspan bigger than a football field the largest one in the world. From nose to tail, it measures 283 feet. And from ground to the tip of the vertical stabilizer, it is 50 feet tall. And it weighs 500,000 pounds. It has six huge passenger jet engines to propel it. Her name? Strato Launch. Strato Launch is the brainchild of billionaire Paul Allen, co founder of Microsoft. The CEO of the corporation built, that is building this aircraft says that Allen has the vision of normalizing access to low Earth orbit. He wants to carry payloads satellites and humans into space in a way that's more economical and flexible than ground-based rockets like SpaceX that launched this past week. Strato Launch is scheduled to take her first flight in 2019 and no whirlwind will be needed. Strato Launch is the connection between Earth and Heaven. Being able to take the payload up into the space, launch it, and safely come back to Earth. Something similar happened when Elijah was lifted into heaven in a whirlwind. Instead of dying, Elijah was taken up, anticipating a time when he would return to Earth, the transfiguration. There in the transfiguration, Elijah reappears on earth with Moses, who the Bible says his body was never found either. Moses and Elijah, they are standing with Jesus, having a conversation, showing Peter, James, and John that Jesus is not only the one like Moses, the lawgiver, but he is also the continuation of Elijah, the greatest prophet, the restorer, the one who calls people to repentance and to worship the one true God. Jesus by speaking and appearing with Moses and Elijah, shows the disciples, and by extension us, that he now supersedes and fulfills all the law and the prophets. Sadly, the Jewish people still expect Elijah to come again. If you've ever been to a Seder meal, traditionally there's an empty seat at the table 
with the hopes that Elijah will return. But in Scripture, Elijah's call was to be a prophet among the Israelites, to call them to repentance and to the worship of the one true God. We're probably most familiar with his showdown at Mount Carmel, right? With the prophets of Baal. His message was, forget the prophets of Baal and the, and the god Baal, the Canaanite god of fertility. It's just a man-made image. To prove it, we'll build altars. And whoever's God calls down fire and burns up the altar, that's the one true God. And of course, the prophets of Baal utterly failed and were subsequently all put to death. Now with Elijah being taken up into heaven with his own personal straddle launch, it tells us, gives us a clue that he's going to come again, reappear, and that his work will continue. Elijah is that living link between earth and the kingdom of God, between our world and God's world. Elijah being at the transfiguration proves that heaven isn't just about the afterlife and that the afterlife isn't just about spirits. Moses and Elijah both were there in the flesh. And that revelation ought to change the way that we live our daily lives. Flying with Elijah on his straddle launch, we keep our eyes both on heaven and on earth. Elisha, as the Old Testament lesson said, went along with Elijah to his straddle launch there. And on the way there, Elisha was given this glimpse as Elijah goes into heaven of the glory that the, of the world to come. And Elisha's going to need it, knowing that his, he's going to carry on the work of Elisha in this northern kingdom of Israel that worshiped the false gods, pagan gods. And he was going to get into a lot of delicate situations. His life would be threatened. Elisha needed to see what Elijah did so that he could put his heart, mind, and strength into accomplishing the work that God had for him. But that's also why the story of the transfiguration is always the gospel lesson for the last Sunday of the Epiphany. Because from here on, we, trans, we, we move on to Lent. And we need to see that glory as well. As we journey in this life, in this fallen world, knowing the trouble that's lying ahead for us as well. Remembering that Jesus says in this prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. You see, sometimes we so focus on a heaven that's out there a, and dream whimsically of a place out there that we lose sight of what we're called to do in this life, which is to be the light of the world, salt on the earth. Why Jesus came has as much to do with the here and now as the world to come. We fall into this trap of thinking that the earthly things, material things are bad and only spiritual things, eternal things are good. But Jesus didn't come just to save our souls. He came to save us both body and soul. He came to redeem the earth, to create a new heaven and a new earth, a new Eden. What that means is that God is also calling us to carry forward the work of the biblical prophets as Jesus did, the work of calling people to repentance and to worship the one true God, telling them to put away the balls, the bales of our day. 
Elisha had this in mind, which is why he asked to inherit a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Knowing that Elijah was about to depart, Elisha wanted that spirit so that he could continue the work that Elijah was doing. You and I are privileged to carry on this work of the prophets as well through our vocations in life. Note that there is a central theme in the prophets that we do well to hear. As we listen to the prophets, we hear a clear and consistent cry for justice. Isaiah challenges us to learn to do good, to seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widows. Jeremiah criticizes those who do not judge with justice the cause of the orphans to make it prosper and do not defend the rights of the needy. In a similar way, Hosea says, hold fast to love and justice. And Amos says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And according to Micah, the Lord requires nothing more of us than this, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, in communities all across the country, Christians are challenged to share, to inherit that double share of Elijah's spirit. The spirit of the biblical prophets leading us to enter new territories and to help people according to the gifts that God has given us through the vocations God has granted us. And in this way, we join God's prophets in seeking justice and rescuing the oppressed and working for the rights of the poor. This puts us on board Elijah's strata launch, which enables us then to connect them to heaven and earth. Because you see, Jesus connected the disciples with heaven and earth. There on that mountain, by seeing Jesus appear in the glory, that gave Peter, James, and John the strength that they would need to continue on the prophet's work of proclaiming the good news to the nations. And they would need it because two of these people, two of these guys would be martyred for their faith. But by seeing the new heavens and the new earth, that gave them the strength to share the good news. Plus, they also needed the good news, that strength for the immediate things that were coming ahead. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, where they would see their master arrested and put on trial, beaten and flogged in disgrace. Peter would be recognized as one of the disciples of which he would deny. James and John would see him crucified, a spear plunged in his side. Is it any wonder then that they really didn't understand what was happening until after the resurrection? You see, the curious thing about Mark's gospel is that those on the outside seem to recognize who Jesus is, while those on the inside, the chosen ones, didn't recognize him. I mean, the demons recognized Jesus, calling him the Holy One of God. The outside people of Tyre and Sidon and the Decapolis recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, and that he could heal. In fact, they believed that all they had to do was just simply touch his robe and they would be healed. While those on the inside, Jesus' brothers thought he was insane. His disciples argued about who's going to be the greatest. It seems his miracles 
didn't have a lasting impact on them. Even coming down the mountain of transfiguration, he tells them, don't tell anyone what you saw until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. <laughs> and that was one of the few things they actually obeyed from Jesus because they didn't tell anyone about the resurrection. They just argued about what Jesus meant about rising from the dead. And that, after seeing Moses and Elijah in the flesh on the mountain. What Mark is pointing out is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, all the laws, making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophets, the one true prophet who can restore Restore people through the forgiveness of sins and offering them redemption. Jesus is the one, the one sent by God to save the world from their sins. Jesus takes, oh, t takes, continues on where Moses and Elijah leave off, calling people to repentance and to the worship of the one true God offering them forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so Jesus then is also our connection between heaven and earth. The faith that we have been given in Jesus through our baptism connects us with heaven and earth. We live with one foot in both kingdoms. We know heaven is ours because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. But we live out our faith in this life. And living out our faith in this life enables us to continue to do justice, to walk humbly with our God. The cross is where we have seen God's glory. Because there on the cross, he loved us in a way that no one else could. The cross is our source of strength as we live life in a fallen world. The cross is where our sins are forgiven so that we can be followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. We sing Alleluia today, but soon we'll put them away for Lent. But that's temporary, just as this earth is temporary. Easter has happened, and we are Easter people, connected to heaven and earth through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives forever. Our lives are characterized by being in heaven and on earth at the same time, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.